how this makes it relevant for the consumer is that usually when people in a restaurant or, or a sommelier or a server brings you wine for you to taste when you've bought it from them, is for you to identify this fault. So if you don't know, if you never kind of tasted a corked wine, you would just you know nod your head saying, well, I'm not going to send it back. I know I kind of don't like it, but you know it is what it is. Maybe I just picked wrong. The Culinary Libertarian Podcast, episode 24. Welcome to the Culinary Libertarian Podcast, where the philosophy is free, but the food is on you. Hello folks, welcome back. Dan Reed here, the Culinary Libertarian. Happy to have you back. Happy to be here. few details. First, visit my podcasts page, culinarylibertarian.com slash podcasts. And there you can follow me on all of my social media icons. Uh, also, if you like this show and like what I'm doing, I would greatly appreciate your support through either Patreon or PayPal, or the Bitcoin links also on the podcast's page. Please do go out, find, rate, and review the show with a positive review on your favorite podcatcher. The more reviews the show gets is the more people who can find it, and the more people who find the show are the more people who get cooking. Also, please do share the show on Facebook or Twitter. Economics is, frankly, mostly dry and dull. As Murray Rothbard noted, it is no crime to be ignorant of economics, which is, after all, a specialized discipline and one that most people consider to be a dismal science. But it is totally irresponsible to have a loud and vociferous opinion on economic subjects while remaining in this state of ignorance. Everywhere on social media, the current political darlings demonstrate their immense ignorance of economics. You can learn what they seemingly have not with the economics class, What's Wrong with Textbook Economics, taught by economist Jeff Herbner. Sign up for this class and over 20 more with my affiliate link, culinarylibertarian.com slash biteback, which takes you to the Tom Woods Liberty Classroom link. Learn the economics, politics, and history the state schools didn't teach you. culinarylibertarian.com slash biteback. Today my guest is Joel Zambrano, a level 2 sommelier. That is not the highest level, but it is a high bar in wine, no pun intended, and is well-earned. I wanted to speak with Joel about wine 101, so to speak. What are some basics we can know about how wine is made, and what to do when we walk into the grocery store facing all of those bottles? How do we know which one to pick to take home and drink? We jumped right into our conversation, so here we go. Let's start at the very beginning and give us uh, a little bit of about of a breakdown uh, about who Joel is and what your current level is and how you got there as a sommelier. Okay. So just basic intro. So I'm Joel Zambrano. I'm a certified level two quartermaster sommelier. Uh, my wine journey is an interesting one. It always starts with something else, which is usually food. So I started more you know, cooking. In the beginning, and once you kind of go into a certain space of cooking, you realize that food by itself is is excellent, but when it's paired with something else that enhances it, then it becomes an experience. And so, kind of the wine journey started with food. And once I, you know, I watched the the, the Netflix special Psalm, it kind of opened that perspective. And by then, I was a member of a few wineries in Washington. Um, I used to live in Washington State in Redmond, Washington. Um, back then, I'm I'm in tech. So my background is a computer scientist, and I used to work and worked for Microsoft for 10 years. But when I was there, I would be a member of these wineries. And when I saw, oh, you know, this has dark cherries and wet forest floor, and, you know, they will go through all of these descriptors in wine, I'll be like, okay, this is very interesting because when I just drink wine, it's either white wine or red wine. I can't pick any of these things up. But when, if you've ever watched this documentary, you, you kind of – leave with it very motivated. And I went to the tasting room again. And when I tasted the wine, I was like, I'm going to try to see if I can pick any of these things out. And I couldn't. Um, 
and that was really the start of the journey. I was like, well, why can't I do these things? And they recommend a few things in the in the documentary, which is to smell things and to drink things and to associate things. And you have to kind of do those things and try wine and find things that you like. And like many of us, my first wines that I liked were sweet white wines because they're sweet and you can kind of you know drink it all the time. And as you progress, you get more uh, complex profiles and things that you like. From there, I moved to California for work. So I work now at Apple. When I was here, I was like, well, you know, I'm actually kind of in this mecca of wine and I'm in the place where the quarter masters is and they do these frequent certifications. I'm just going to at least sign up for the first one and see how far can I go. And, you know, I've I had the wine Bible by Carrie McNeil as a resource. I've read a few of it, got excited about it, planned a whole European trip around it. And, you know, I tried it my first time. I met a lot of people in the industry. There was like 95% of the people in the level one were people from the industry. Um, there's a 90% pass rate. Uh, for that particular examination, I happened to pass, but I was also sitting next to a lady who, you know, this was her job and she didn't. And so it's a little kind of depressing when you have this guy who's just doing it for kicks um, and you have this other person who is kind of the thing they do every day and one passes and the other doesn't. Um, so that also kind of hinted at me that, well, you know, I kind of might be decent at picking these things out. And of course, at this level, there was no tasting. It was just knowing theory. And this lady also had a enology degree. So I don't know why. I think she just was very confident about it and didn't study for three years and then just said like, hey, I'm going to go take this test. After that, there is they have a deductive tasting workshop, which I highly encourage. They go through a lot of wines and they kind of, you know, make you go through the deductive tasting method with the master sommelier and you learned a lot. Again, by then I was able to pick some markers from the very kind of um, edge oriented wines, like a Chardonnay, like it's an easy, like California Chardonnay is an easy thing to pick out versus you know, a Chablis or an Albarino, those things would be very difficult to like pick out if you're having them side by side. Um, but it really kind of helped me build this decision tree in my mind of like, if I see this color, I can filter all of these things away. If I taste this and I can filter all these things away and eventually get to the place where I want it. So I had this friend who I met uh, randomly at a bar here when I just got here and she also worked at Apple and she was like, yeah, I'm taking my level two. And so it felt, and she was working at a wine bar. So when I saw her, I was like, well, if she can do this of keeping a full-time job, studying all this stuff and working a second job to just keep it going, then maybe I can. So she was kind of the inspiration to do it. And, you know, I signed up to take my level two. I, you know, you cue a Rocky montage of getting better, right? Where you, I would like open six bottles of wine every week, like a particular varietal and, and write down, everything I'm supposed to uh, get from the wines and drink every three hours and spit it out, of course, because I was actually doing this at work. My work was very supportive of this uh, habit. And, you know, I felt I felt decently confident. Now, uh, level two examination breaks down to taste, theory, and service. So I got the theory down, right? I studied through a whole lot of uh, content that they have in the website, all the regions in the world. You know, I kind of felt confident there. I went through tasting. There is around 16 different wines that they can give you two whites and two reds from. So I practiced through all of them and I felt confident with them. Um, and the service was like how hard, at this point, it involves opening a bottle of champagne and serving a table. And I was like, how hard could that be? Well, it turns out that when I went, I passed my theory, I passed my tasting, and I felt service because I have never done it before. And this was like a real restaurant that they had the setting on and, you know, you had to... Uh, articulate to this master somebody who's going to be grilling you about co mixed cocktails and who makes crystal and, you know, what's in a rusty nail while you're pouring these things. So it's, it was a, a very daunting thing for someone who's never done it. So after that failure, um, I went and got a job at a wine bar, worked for three months, and then I was very, fairly confident. Uh, and so when I did the retake in Mexico City, then I passed everything. But it was definitely a journey in wine. It was not something that was like, oh, you know, I can wake up and I'm a talented wine guy. Um, it does take like practice. Really drinking a lot of wine is really the only way you're going to get better at wine. And I think the biggest takeaway is you have to remove this concept of the things that you like. Because as a sommelier, wine has a purpose, right? It was, as you said, um, wine, is, it's built by a person. Someone thinks about, you know, where they are in the world. Uh, what they have in the soil, what their budget is, what expression they want, and 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 they actually craft this fermented juice and 
hopefully it's an expression of what they want to say. And, you know, it's very easy for us to drink it and be like, oh, I don't like this, uh, just because it doesn't kind of seem pleasant in that time. But if we go back to our initial journey, wine really exists because of food. So usually if you find a wine that you don't necessarily like, it's probably you're not having it with the right pairing or it's a badly executed wine. Um, but as you mentioned, kind of in the modern day of competitive winemaking, producing bad wine doesn't last very long. It's, just, it's a multi-million dollar endeavor. So it has to be relatively decent if it's either um, to please the masses on drinking kind of affordable wine, which is meant to be like a cocktail wine, or if it's more of a handmade craft product where it's meant to be kind of enjoyed as part of a meal in a particular setting. So that's kind of, in a very long nutshell, my background in wine and kind of the things that interest me. I guess if I were to be very concrete on the things that interest me is finding value. I think it's very easy to go to fine wine. I think it's also very easy to say like, oh, these are the things that I like and just be niched about them. But I'm really just trying wine out there every week because I do some tastings at work. And I try wines that I've never tried before. And the objective is to say, like, is there something that's really good that I perceive to, to, to be very good and that uh, it's not $100 a bottle? Um, and that's really the exciting part of me, Ruth Wine. And, of course, getting to travel and see all these places. Oh, sure. Travel part would be the fun part. I mean, in addition to drinking the work, 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 I have to go drink wine. Oh, more was me. All right. Well, let's start with just some really, really basic questions. And, and, and I'm confident you can answer this. What is wine? Okay. Well, wine, as I mentioned, is literally just fermented grape juice. And probably it happened um, to a very early version of man where they probably discovered that um, they can pick grapes and put them in some pouch. It probably was like some sort of leather or stomach type of pouch that the old um, uh, humans had. And probably someone forgot to eat them and left them in that pouch for maybe a day. And, and fermentation happens really easily and very quickly. If you notice, a grape has like a little white dust usually with it, and that dust is yeast. So as soon as the skin is breached and the sugar comes out, that yeast starts to go to town on the sugar and start producing alcohol and CO2. So probably someone forgot it and then... They smelled it the next day and was like, oh, kind of interesting. It's kind of yucky, but, you know, I'm going to drink it. I don't know what goes through their mind of drinking things that, you know, pretty much rotted away. Um, and then they probably got a little drunk and said, like, this is pretty interesting. And that's pretty much how wine started. From there, probably people thought of, um, you know, trying different vessels. And you can see this back to, like, um, I think the Greeks that tried to store it in some clay pots. Um, and obviously from there, the Romans and the Romans kind of distributed all through Europe. So it kind of evolved. It's, that's why European wine is more refined. It's just had a few more thousand years, uh, head start on kind of the process of wine. Um, but that's literally it. It's, it's just fermented grape juice. Let's bring it up to the modern time. So we've got just, you know, whatever your vineyard is. And so the, the grapes have been picked and they're going through the crusher and the winemaker takes some of the juice and he sips it. So here's one of the things that I found interesting when I worked at a, at a winery in, in New Jersey. So the winemaker's sipping the, the grape juice and determining at least two things. And one is, what does it taste like immediately? And what latent flavors am I getting? Now, the real question is, how do I decide, and this is part of my question to you, if you know the answer, how does that, what's going through the winemaker's mind to figure out what to mask and what to reveal, and how is that process done? I think that there's a couple of answers there, actually. It probably isn't a single one. It probably depends also on the winemaker, but usually I think that everyone, when you have an idea of building something, you have that exactly, an idea of what that final product is going to look like. And I think in wine, you know, there's very privileged winemakers that have the benefit of saying, oh, I can uh, taste a grape and know exactly where I'm going to go with this. Or, or I even start from the beginning, from the, from the end, where you say, I want to produce a Chardonnay that's crisp, you know, and, and enumerate all of these uh, characteristics of a Chardonnay that they want, and then be able to go back to the grape and then build it from that way. And I think that doesn't necessarily work all the time. I think what usually happens is Mother Nature has given me this. 
what is the best that I can do with this? And, and there's a lot of things that um, are in their disposal, right? Uh, and there's also a lot of things that could have happened to that year. So as you said, the grapes have been picked. We still don't know like what the weather was on that day that could have been like not great or great. Um, we also know how bad that year was. It could be great or not great. Um, and even then he has even choices when he's crushing the grapes. It could be like, do I single pick every berry? Do I use a whole cluster? Do I like, what can I do to the grapes even before I kind of pressing them? Um, and even then when you press, you know, obviously you're going to get kind of the first press juice, which will lead to like the fancy label. And then there's the second and third presses, can, which could lead to like a second label. And how am I going to make those things different? How am I going to market those? So there's all of these are just decisions, decisions, decisions. And usually um, I think as a, as a winemaker, the, what goes through their mind is, okay, nature has given me this, or I've, or I've managed to produce a fruit that has these qualities. How can I make the best of it? And, and it does align to kind of that targeted goal of saying like, oh, I want to make a very crisp Chardonnay. Maybe they, you could be stubborn and say, I'm going to try and force this to be that. Or be like, well, you know, if God gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Um, so I think those are the kind of the two factors. And sometimes that's why you might get, um, you know, the Europeans approaches, they, they kind of follow the same process. And if they say like, oh, the, the, the fruit is not good this year, I'm not even going to bother making the wine because I don't even want to start there. Um, of course, uh, us in kind of the new world, we have to make money. So they, they would decide to actually just go with the flow and say, like, if it's not that great, maybe the consumer won't notice it. And that's OK. But once it's pressed and it's in the juice, we, we one of the questions we had was, was like, what yeast? And obviously, it depends on what we said. What style of wine are we going to make? If it's going to be a California buttery Chardonnay, it's, you have to pick one particular yeast. If you want this crisp kind of old world Chardonnay, then there's another type of yeast and all of them have to do with the alcohol tolerances that they have. So it's all decisions. And even then, it's not a decision that you make once in the sense that once the um, grapes are crushed, that it goes into the barrel and you put the, or it goes into the bins and you put the yeast and they ferment and my job's over. Like the winemaker has to make adjustments pretty often right? Even at maybe the beginning day to day, later on week to week to ensure like, do, am I getting the right acid? Am I getting the right oak? Am I getting um, the right finish on things? Is this the right blend? Um, there's so many decisions that happen and it's not like once. Of course, they all compound. I think that if you make a wrong turn earlier in the beginning or earlier, um, then they kind of multiply towards the end and you can get like a more magnified error at the end. But same thing, if you make really good choices in the beginning, at the end, adjusting small errors is not a big deal. So I, I hope that kind of makes sense or. It, it does actually. It, it's, I hadn't considered the, the visualization of the, of the design. So as a baker and as a cook, uh, when I set out to sort of retool a recipe with a specific end in mind, uh, I do, as you described, a sort of reverse engineer in my head, what it is I wanted to end up with, and I know my ingredients well enough that I can, I can get where I want to go because I have the I, I have the destination in mind, and and I don't know why that eluded me, but somehow the the, the I'm visualizing this this person with this grape juice, and then having all of these yeasts from which to choose. But of course, that's silly because if you're cooking dinner you exclude half or more of your ingredients just because of the thing that you're making. So that it's one of those things that, duh, now that you mentioned it, it makes perfect sense, but somehow I missed it. Let's talk just real quickly, because I know that there's, there's, there's more than we can deal with, but so we've got two basics, red wine, red grapes and white grapes. And one of the in interesting things that I learned was that wine Wine grapes are not like the grapes you buy at the grocery store. The the inside is actually juice, and the juice in all of them is white. <laughs> I was like, well, that's interesting. So um, what does it mean for a grape to be a noble grape, and what does it mean for a varietal? The concept of nobility in grapes comes from just tradition. I think that certain regions have deemed a set of grapes to be noble. And this nobility is changes for countries. So, um, you know, not just even country, even regions. 
So the noble grapes of Alsals, like include Gewurztraminer, which maybe in uh, Burgundy, that, which doesn't grow this, would not. So I think it's just a subclassification of, of pretty much saying for our wine region, here are the grapes that matter to us. Um, now for varietals, I mean, you said it, there, there, there's one kind of clone or the one species of grapes that we use, which is uh, Vitis vinifera, and it has variants. And those variants are called varietals. And some of our varietals have like relationships. So for example, Cabernet Sauvignon is a product of Sauvignon Blanc, hence the Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc, hence the Cabernet. So Cabernet Sauvignon comes from Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. Um, so, and can you deduce these things from um, like, if you drink a Sauvignon Blanc, can you say like, oh, I could taste some grassiness in the, cap, uh, in the, in the Cabernet Sauvignon? And if you taste the Cabernet Franc, oh, I get some peppery from, you know, from the Cab Franc. Like, I, I can't. I think there's just differences that happen, and they just happen to be related. And there might be some properties that do get passed down. But, um, you know, it's it's something that you just have to try the wine and see if you can pick it out. But so that's kind of the the the, the answer on the varietals and noble uh, distinctions. Let's take a moment out for a word from one of my affiliates. Pretty pictures on bottles is no way to pick a proper wine. Well, <laughs> sure, I've done it, and at the grocery store where there aren't trained staff, well, it's as good a system as any. We can do better. California Wine Club offers a variety of subscription packages for all wine drinkers, from the just learning to the more aged. They have a wide selection of not just domestic, but also international wines. Learn why California Wine Club is the most loved wine club. Click over with my link, culinarylibertarian.com slash wine, and learn how you can get $1 spring shipping in bottles for as low as $9.99. California Wine Club has various subscription levels for you, and corporate gifts as well. Give a wine adventure. Click over to culinarylibertarian.com slash wine and start your adventure today. Now let's get back into the show. You made a comment a moment ago about uh, opening a bottle of wine and not necessarily liking it. Now, one of the things that I've noticed, and I think anybody who pays even a little bit of attention to bottles of wine will notice, uh, I think particularly with reds, is... Once that bottle's been opened, say, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, especially if it's in the glass, there is a sometimes a dramatic change in, in certainly in flavor, but also in flavor profile and in texture. So what's going on that this wine seems to be transforming sort of before our eyes? Right. Um like I don't know the specifically the scientific processes that happen there. I think evaporation and kind of the the, the movement of some of these chemicals out of the wine helps. Uh, the only time I like where it's more pronounced is when you open like older wine. Um, so a good example is I recently opened like this nine year old Zinfandel. You know, it's Zinfandel. It's fruity and highly an al- uh, highly alcoholic. But I opened it, I remember like it's, I, I was very excited about it. And you do the first taste to see if it's corked. It wasn't corked, but it was like so acidic. And it was just, I don't know. It wasn't something that made me feel like, gosh, I did the right choice by opening this bottle. But I still left it there because it was like, fine, it's opened. Um, I didn't think of decanting it, which is where the, really the, the, the trick is. But once, as you said, like 30 minutes later, I, was, I went back and because I finished cooking and I went back and had another sip. And I was like, whoa, this someone change the wine because this is not the same wine that I had when, when I just opened this. So a lot of the kind of harsh acidity had kind of mellowed out. You can definitely start to get more of the secondary flavors of the wine due to the age. The alcohol, you know, at the beginning, it's very um, kind of in your face. And this is true of even young wines when you open them. But now it has mellowed out and kind of uh, evaporated. And, and alcohol makes a big difference because it gives uh, wine body. So if you just get in the beginning, either you're going to get the sensation of overwhelmness and it might even burn. You feel that kind of your, your your palate burning with all the alcohol. And once it smooths out, you know, it, it, it's a pleasant thing. So again, I can't necessarily speak to the scientific things that happen when it aerates, because that's really what we are doing to the wine. 
But I do feel that even uh, if you can dedicate the time to even affordable wines to decant them, not wine, not white wines, but for red wines, I think you will see a major improvement and definitely have a sample in the beginning before decanting and then having something after an hour would be the best to see the contrast. You used the term a minute ago, and I want you to explain what does it mean when you say corked? Ah, okay. So um, corked is a wine defect. And again, I don't remember necessarily the kind of the scientific process of what it is. I know it is a particular fault that comes from the cork itself. Um, the, the, the translation, pretty much the practical feeling of a wine that's corked is, and this is a, a difficult thing. If this, you know, it, it was a hard thing for me to pick out. Normally I would categorize this wine as, oh, I don't like this wine, but really the wine was corked and I didn't know. But the profile that you would get would be, and this is true for whites and reds, which is another giveaway. If you, if you taste a wine, a white wine and it's corked and you taste a red wine and it's corked, there'll be, there will be a common theme, which will be like, hey, that's weird. Why would these wines taste similar? Um, the most, uh, the way I really nailed down identifying cork wine was once I opened this Rioja, which is Tempranillo in Spanish wine, open it, you smell it, and it was, it's a smell of wet cardboard. And it tastes like that too. So I was like, okay, maybe the glass, I didn't wash this glass fine. So I you know, dumped that, got another glass, poured it again, tasted it. I was like, nope still tastes like cardboard um and it wasn't fruity it wasn't like it was just like musky and wet cardboard taste so i was like fine okay so maybe this wine is corked and i knew it wasn't some a wine that i disliked because it was like my favorite producer from this place so i knew what the wine should taste like and this was not tasting like it should and then i followed and opened um another a french wine that i just wanted to try it was so i think it was a cap franc so same thing, I opened the, the wine, I smelled the cork, and it was like, it smells the same. I was like, is this the same wine? And then I same thing, I poured it on the glass, I give it a swirl, I tasted it, and tasted like this wet cardboard. And I was like, wait, maybe maybe this glass is still dirt. So I did the same thing. I got another glass, I washed it, poured it again, same thing. So I figured I just got two corked wines in a row, which is it's unlikely, usually just 5% of wine um, is corked. Uh, which is a uh, sad, sad thing. But however, this was a great uh, lesson in identifying kind of corked wine. Now, how ma this makes it relevant for the consumer is that usually when people in a restaurant or, or a sommelier or a server brings you wine for you to taste when you've bought it from them, is for you to identify this fault. So if you don't know, if you never kind of tasted a corked wine, you would just you know, nod your head saying, well, I'm not going to send it back. I know I kind of don't like it, but you know, it is what it is. Maybe I just picked wrong. But once you have that marker in your mind of when a wine is corked, it's very easy for you to just say it's corked and they'll replace it immediately. Now it comes to the part where we're going to go, figuratively speaking, into the grocery store because we can assume probably correctly that there isn't anybody in the entire staff who can speak with knowledge and authority about wines. So... Uh, the listeners going into the local whatever it is, and there's the wine section, and now what? <laughs> Someone is looking for – so is there a strategy to how the wines are displayed, top to bottom? What's going on? Yeah. So I think before we get to that, I think also that not all wine aisles are created equal. I think there's places that care. So – if you were to go to your regular, like, I don't know, I'm just going to quote some California places. If you go to Safeway, the experience of like the staff doesn't know, right? They just put the wine on the shelves. There may be the wine guy that probably um, gets to set up the contracts and maybe occasionally gets to taste a thing or two, but he has definitely not tasted a lot of the wines that are there. Um, an experience that I have, I, I most of the wines that I buy, I buy them from Whole Foods just because there's another, they, they have a certified sommelier on the staff and I can... You know, we can talk wine all the time and I can just tell her like, hey, I want wines that have this profile. And she'll be like, I tasted this this time ago and this month ago. And, this, you know, and she's able to say, I tried this. This is what you want. Um, and of course, if you go to a smaller boutique um, wine store, obviously everyone, everything that's there, someone has tasted and that's why it's there. So you, there is value of going to a smaller shop just because you will get that um, attention. Now, the, the drawback is if you don't speak quote unquote, you know, wine, 
then it's kind of useless because people will come in and I'll be like, I want something that's dry. And I'll be like, well, technically a lot of the wine here is dry because dry is meaning kind of the alcohol, the, the sugar, you know, the residual sugar on the wine. And you're just, you want to, you're telling me something else. You want to tell me something else by using the wrong term. Um, but so if we get that out of the way, if, let's assume that you're in a basic uh, grocery store uh, where uh, there is no staff, there's no one to guide you. How do you navigate that, that scenario? And so you have kind of have to understand, and we're also assuming that this is for, let's just say, American wine, just so we simplify things. Uh, so you're, you're in the cab aisle, which will almost guarantee that it's mostly American Cabernet. Um, everything that's on the bottom will usually be labeled um, by the state. So in this case, I'm in California. So a lot of the lower shelf one just says, you know, Cabernet mm -hmm. Sauvignon, California, and then a vintage. So what that means is that to produce that wine, they could use grapes from anywhere in the state. And it has to be like, I think it's 60 or 70% Cabernet Sauvignon. And the other things could be whatever they want. Now, usually the price ranges for those is between like six to nine dollars, which because you know they can just they go out, buy things in bulk, make a wine that's easy to drink. And that's the objective, is that it has to be easy to drink. So they usually probably add more sugar and they play with the acid more. Right, they might add other preservatives such that when you drink it, it probably don't, won't have a lot of character, but it'll be you know something easy to shut down, and that's really the purpose. Uh, if you continue going up, you'll probably find something that has like a county. So in here, you could say something that says Sonoma County, which is a smaller region of the state. It's not necessarily something that's called an AVA, which is an American Viticulture Area, uh, which means you know all the fruit has to come from that county. The next level up would be a, an ABA, as I mentioned. So the other one would say like Sonoma or Napa Valley. Um, and there might be even sub uh, ABAs within that, like uh, Rutherford or Yountville. All of these would be smaller regions within that. So as, as we get, as we reduce the area where the fruit can be picked, you can expect that uh, bottle to be higher up the shelves and, of course, getting higher up in price because. You know, the price to buy per ton to buy that fruit from a particular place gets more expensive as you narrow down the area. Because there you're picking by, like, if that place has a particular climate. And we're going back to all of these winemaker decisions. Like, what can the winemaker get? And how nuanced do they want the fruit to be to produce something that they define as a quality product? And then at the very top of the shelves, you find the things that are called kind of estate bottled or like their pre the premium wine. And so that what that means is that it comes from a particular uh, vineyard. Some of them might say, sorry, a state bottle, which means they grew it on the properties that they have in, in those vineyards in that place, and then crushed and bottled it all within that same location. So the grapes never actually left the area where they were grown. Everything was processed there. And then once bottled, it got distributed. So those are there, and also the single vineyards. So something that would say like Napa Valley Martha's Vineyard, which is like a very particular place, and hence commands a particular price because um, you only get a very small amount of grapes that you can produce from this uh, particular vineyard, and hence with the microclimate and all of the particular nuances of that place, you, in theory, can get a higher quality um, product if you've done the right process. So going back, so we go back to state, county, AVA, and then estate or slash vineyard. And that's really what you're seeing from top to bottom, from, sorry, from bottom to top in the wine aisle. Now, does it mean that a uh, estate bottle wine or a um, single vineyard wine will taste better than the regular Napa Valley one? Maybe, maybe not. And we're talking about differences of almost double, right? So usually... The bottom costs like eight to nine. Then the county will probably cost like 10 to 15. Then the AVA ones will cost 15 to 25, right? And the top ones would cost 25 and above. So sometimes they double in price. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to like double in flavor or double in whatever experience you're getting. And that's really the, the key with wine that you might go ahead and buy, you know, a $200 bottle of wine. And if you can't tell, then you really are not getting your money's worth, right? And you could go and buy a $15 bottle of wine and enjoy it thoroughly. So I think 
as with food, I don't know if you remember your journey in food, but at least my journey in food started with fast food as you're a kid, right? Burgers are the best thing and pizza is amazing. And as you progress and you make and you try and you experiment all of these cuisines of the world, you can still go back and enjoy a burger and a pizza, but you know that there's more to life than that. And you probably are willing to pay more than the $20 that a pizza costs to get a really better experience. And the same thing is with wine, right? In the beginning, you might start off with the cheap, uh, sweet wine that everyone starts off with and ultimately end up, you know, getting some expensive wine later on. Yeah, I remember, well, food is a little cloudier for uh, specific memories, but I have a very clear memory of being a big, big fan, I'm sorry to say, of White Zinfandel. Oh, God. <laughs> but, you know, it's <laughs> White Zinfandel is the gateway wine, so... Um, it, it's just it's just horrible, but it's it it served the purpose, and then I I learned better, so I've gotten I've, I've gotten more education since then, so that was a good thing. But see, to a certain degree, we must have these types of wine that gets us starting on the journey, right? So I know we we confront on them now because we know better, but when we don't, we kind of have to start somewhere, and and they serve the purpose, right? We need people drinking wine, and and if that's going to get you to you know get better wine later on and demand and increase the demand for good wine, then so be it. I don't disagree. I'm just sort of embarrassed for myself. We're in the grocery store and we've made our decision and maybe we're going to buy a bottom, a middle and a top tier wine just because we want to take these home and and do a little learning. How how do we do that? There's the, you know, draw the air through, over your tongue. That's actually kind of hard to do without choking. Put pretense aside. Just a, a person bought three bottles of wine and has a spaghetti dinner and wants to say, you know what? Well, I'm looking for, I decide I want, I want compatibility and I want to taste these things, or maybe I've got cheese, but that's not the, the food's immaterial. How does the listener start to develop a palate to recognize what is acceptable? Hmm. So it, it's, there's, I mean, the only, the, there's two ways I'm thinking about your question. Um, the first one is usually when I find people at the wine aisle and I tend to kind of proud in people's business and be like, Hey, so what are you, what are you looking for? I'm like, like I become the, the wine assistant there. And I usually ask like, what are you eating is the first thing. Cause I think that rarely do you just, I mean, I know I do, but I do open wine to open wine and not necessarily eat anything, but there's the profile of that wine. The wine that you're going to drink without any food is different than the wine that you're going to open up when you're having some sort of meal. So I think that distinction needs to be made up front because there's wines that you simply cannot enjoy without food just because of their character. So if we're having spaghetti dinner, you know, I'll probably steer you away from like a Pinot Noir just because it will be too delicate, right? If you have like a great grated Parmesan cheese and black pepper on your spaghetti dinner, you're really kind of losing the nuance. And, and spaghetti also with a tomato is just too acidic. And it'll just, it'll work. I'm not saying you're not going to enjoy it, but it's not like the, the best experience you could have. I think that if, if people want to really have or start to develop a palate for different styles of wine, then, I mean, they could do some research on food that pairs with it and then start to have those glasses uh, or buy that type of wine based on what they're going to eat. However, if they say like, no, I don't want to make a dinner just to drink wine. I just want to go through the ropes of, tasting different styles, then uh, I think you should buy or get the things that you're curious about and and go from there. And maybe once you feel like, and, and try to stick to a varietal in the beginning, because I think that you may pick one, you may pick like, oh, I'm going to get this Italian wine, or I'm going to get a cab. And the first one you get, you don't like at all. So I think stick to a varietal, start with maybe the one in the bottom of the shelf, not so much to the bottom of the shelf, like try to be above $10, then get something that's between 15 and 20, then get something that's over 25 and see if you can taste anything different. And if you have some preference and whatever your preference is, if you like the 
bottom one, that's great. I mean, remember, both you and you started with White Symphonio, and I started with Muscat Canelli, which is a sweet thing. Um, and it's okay to like that stuff, but it's always the journey, right? It's not, I think it's not easy for us, or it's not, I wouldn't recommend that once you find something you really like to just stay with that. It's good to have your preference and, and you know, oh, today's the, my preferred wine day, but always push yourself to see, well, now I'm going to try something else just to kind of develop it. Otherwise, it's very easy to be niched and, you know, never move out of yellowtail cabs and because they're cheap and then taste okay. I think you really have to kind of push it. And really the best time where you can experience those nuances are when you have food or if you actually go to a winery, because there you can kind of walk through the experience with someone that's guiding you and start to maybe pick up on a few of these things. But I think it's something that has to start like at your home and done pretty frequently so that you can start to develop uh, a palette for it. Uh, an experience that I had recently is we had we have this couple friend who um, they say, like, we drink a bottle of wine every day. I really don't care what I drink, but I mean, we usually buy an $8 cab, and this is all we buy, like the classical Menage a Trois from Safeway. And we went to dinner one time, and I took this Napa Valley uh, single vineyard. It was $35, the bottle of cab. And we went through it. We, I was really enjoying it. We, you know, it was really nice. And then it ended. And he was like, hey, do you want to continue? I'll just open a bottle of the Menage a I was like, sure. And as soon as you try, you, it's like it's overly sweet, overly simplistic. And they got it there. Because before, I've always tried to kind of uh, get them to drink better wine. But we usually start, um, if you start from the, from the affordable wine to the non-affordable wine, it's harder to know. But if you go the other way, which in this case, out of coincidence, we did. We started with the nice wine, and then we went to the more affordable wine. It really jumps at you the differences of how uh, it's meant to be drunk easily, and how it's supposed to be sweet, and how there isn't a lot of other good things going on. Well, that's an interesting observation. Uh, I want to make sure I just get something clear. When you're saying varietals, you just mean a single grape wine, as opposed to say a blend or a meritage. Yeah, and and all of those things have a meaning. So meritage just is, a, is the American term for a Bordeaux blend. So even that has a thing. And not a lot of people might know that. So if you see meritage, it means it has five, it could have up to five grapes, which are Cab Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, um, uh, Petit Bordeaux, and Malbec. That's what meritage means. But yeah, blends are just a whole world on its own. And then the other daunting part, and that's why I said like stay to new world or at least to the american wines is because once we go to european wines you're not really talking varietals you're talking places and you have to know that this place means this varietal and sometimes they could also be blends so it's it's a little daunting right especially in the french section or in the italian ones because they just have these foreign words and you have to know what it is and what it tastes like and, and that one might be a more kind of a daunting thing to, to try right off the bat. That's why I think if you stick to kind of the things that even the U.S. makes well, which are Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blancs, um, Pinot Noirs, and Cabernets, and of course there's other ones, but if you stick to kind of those four and then grow out of that and do research beforehand on what what those bottles of exotic things are, then I think you'll be in a better place than if you just start like with a French Chinon you know, what are you going to get? And is, are you going to like it? It might be too, um, remember the styles are just very different where um, the Europeans tend to be more of a nuanced secondary flavors. It's not about the fruit. It's about like, is it leathery? Is it peppery? Is it, you know, um, minerally versus the the um, California style or the American style of fruit first, right? So do you get apples and pears or blackberries and cherries? Um, so I think for the beginner in the wine world, starting in the new world, or at least with California wine, is a lot easier to, to, to take. Now, the disclaimer is it's also easy to get used to, such that when you get out of that, uh, you might not necessarily find it as pleasant. Because again, California wine or just new world wine is meant, or is also designed to mostly be drunk by itself, not necessarily with food. So if you just go ahead and open some of these exotic ones that don't have the food that goes with them, then you might be put off. 
So that's the other challenge. That's an interesting observation about California, uh, well, American wines. Uh, I want to ask you, I th- it's been my observation that Australia and Argentina are pretty much in line with uh, the American process as far as the single grape goes. Um, I find some dependability in Argentinian wines to be spicy, and I find some dependability in the Australian wines to be a little on the velvety side, but not overly complex. Yeah, um, most of these, um, most of the New World, so New World is just everything other than Europe, will have the label, in the label, the varietal that it is. So that's why they align and they're easy to predict. Now, they're still, each country will have a nuanced, and, and that's why I encourage people to say, I guess, nail the American expression first, because most of these other countries are kind of modeling after that sometimes. Because, for example, if you like cabs, and I don't know if you ever had Chilean cabs, they tend to have this herbaceousness to them. Now, normally, cabs have some herbaceousness, but Chilean Cabernets tend to be like over the top. And that might be a good thing for some people that like that. But in my case, like I'm, I don't kind of like herbaceousness in my wine. So that for me is like, oh, and I, that's how I know that when I have this particular wine, I know it's a cab and I know it's from Chile because I don't necessarily like it. Um, so it, it, it helps to, I guess, get familiar with a local expression of a wine or one varietal that you like, and then kind of start exploring those boundaries of what else exists. So I'm. This is strictly your opinion because I'm, it's going to be different for everybody, and 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 actually probably even meal to meal. But do you tend to favor contrast or complement for your food pairings? I I think that's a trick question. Well, it it, it depends, and 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 that's the beauty of it because I think we were so used to you know oh you know white wines always go with fish and you should never use red wines with fish or by oh you know cabernets always go with steak you cannot just put a vegetable dish on it, and I think there's lots of these rules that, and, and most of them apply, but there's always exceptions, and so being being able to um, follow these rules is good i think in the beginning when you're trying to be safe but you will be surprised how many of these exceptions exist where you can have like a good pinot with a rich salmon dish and be perfectly okay and it, and it actually is a very delightful experience well i happen to think that pinot and salmon is probably one of the best combinations going so you're saying you wouldn't put a 75 petrus with the dover sole yeah, I mean, it really depends. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. So we, we've tackled, I think, a little bit about how to see the wines at your grocery store. And I agree that if you happen to have a, a local wine guy or a Total Wine franchise, and Total Wine, I have to tell you, that they're, they're not paying me for this. I find them very impressive. Um, or, or a place where at least the staff is trained to know what it is that they're selling, save over your local Kroger, where the pimply high school kid probably doesn't know what he's talking about. We could get into, and I'm interested in just a little bit from you about this, but but fortified wines and champagnes can be an entirely different show, or probably two, but... Well, let's stick with champagnes because, you know, Fortify, we have ports and Madeiras and Sherry's and that's that's too much. Give us, if you can, some some nutshell of how do we decide what sparkling wines to drink and maybe more importantly, what sparkling wines to avoid at all costs. Ooh, I guess that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tricky question. Um, okay. I I mean, there's so many categories, right? Uh, in the sense that there's styles of how to make, uh, I guess, sparkling wine. So let's just talk about that one first, and then I can kind of go through both cost and quality because it, it really is dependent on how, how they're made. Um, so sparkling wine is, is still wine that's fermented to a certain degree. And if we just follow the champagne method, the champenois method, what they do is you have your still wine, they add extra sugar and extra juice to that wine, and then they add another portion of yeast, and then they lock it up. And the purpose of that is to have that yeast go through that extra sugar and create carbonation such that you get your bubbles. 
And that's really what Champagne is. The only difference is that it's made in that Champagne region. That's why it's called Champagne. Um, how, my, how much of that sugar uh, that's added determines the dryness. And if we go into dry, there's Brut Natur, which is the driest. It's supposed to be completely dry. Then uh, extra Brut, then Brut, and then demi sec. And I guess then after that is sec, which is another, like we're not talking sweet stuff now. Um, so th those the terminologies add to what level of sweetness uh, a sparkling wine has. And I think most of even um, New World wines will use, you know, that brute denotation to know, to, den you know, give you an idea of how dry this wine is. Um, the next thing is, is what they use to make the sparkling wine. So if we talk champagne exclusively, it's uh, made with three varietals. It's Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Petit Meunier. Uh, if you just get a regular champagne that says it's non-vintage and it means it doesn't have a year, you're getting a blend of those three things. Uh, but sometimes you would see something called Blanc de Blancs and one and another one they call Blanc de Noirs. And so the Blanc de Blanc is just, it, it's made with Chardonnay. And the Blanc de Noirs, it could be with Pinot and the Petit Meunier. And they have different profiles because obviously they're different varietals. Um, so even then, now we're, we're you can go through dimensions of dryness and dimensions of blends. Either you will have the three or you have two or you have one. Um, so all of those variables exist just in champagne, and they can also translate out to all sparkling wine. And then from there, we also have quality levels. So the regular, if we're just, again, talking just champagne, right? Your regular off-the-shelf champagne bottle, which costs around $35 to $45, um, Ha, it's non-vintage. That means it doesn't have a year. It just says like Veuve Clicquot, and it's uh, you know has a yellow label. Oh, and also there's another one I forgot. One more is the rosé version of it, which is the most expensive one. Um, so even then, there's four variables for that. But so the standard one again, thirty-five to forty-five, will have these uh, three varietals. They are not necessarily they're kind of picked from the whole Champagne region, but there is something called like Premier Cru vineyards. That means like the best of the best, and these are have been uh, classified by monks and people that have lived there for thousands of years and say they just know that the wines from these slopes are the best ones. And so uh, for them to be able to produce a consistent output of champagne, they blend across years. That's why they can't have a year. And that's a problem just that weather in champagne is not that stable. So for them to have a consistent output, they have reserves of different years and to produce the same flavor, like Moet and Chandon would probably blend across and say like, yeah, this tastes like that year's and last year's and last year's. And that's your entry level champagne. From there, there's something called a vintage champagne. That means that they only use the fruit from that year. And that's why that doubles the price. So we're talking about something that says like a 2006 Moet and Chandon. We're talking about $80. So now $80 or $90. We double in price. Did we double in quality? Maybe. And I actually, my experience with it is if you go non-vintage to vintage, that jump is enormous and it's worth it. For me, it's worth that money. The next tier above that is the Tete de Cuvée, which is the top of the top. Sure, they might have other labels in between, but usually don't, don't mess with those. Just go to the top. The, the, the best champagne bottle they produce. So for example, for Rue Clicquot, it's Le Grand Dame. For Moet and Chandon, it's Dom Perignon. And so now we've doubled again. We were in 90 and we're now 180, $200. The jump from vintage to that, and, and the Tete de just means it's the best grapes they could get from the best vineyards they got from that year. And you can find the nuances and you can detect that this is a higher quality uh, product, but not as big as the jump from the non-vintage to the vintage. And this is, again, my personal opinion on, on this. And I've done a lot of these... Uh, kind of vertical or actually horizontal tastings of a particular brand. And I've done it with Tatinger, I've done it with Veuve Clicquot, and I've done it with Perio Jouet. And it's always like that. You start in the non-vintage, it's good. You try the vintage, you're like, wow, that was a big jump. And then you try the double price of that, and you're like, it's, it's slightly better, but it's not $100 better. Um, so within that world, all of these processes involved putting some sugar in the bottle, letting it ferment, and once it fermented fully to the level that you want, they degorge the bottle and then cork it again. 
and then they ship it to to people. So that's really it's a lot of labor because when they put in that secondary juice and the yeast, it all of that stays in the bottle. So they have to riddle. That's a process they go. They use these. Um, they kind of put the bottles at an angle such that they, every so often they or every day they turn the bottle and have the yeast fall into the neck of the bottle. So that takes a while. And usually, again, for the, for champagne, it's a year and a half that they need to age in the bottle for the non-vintage and and two or three years plus for the uh, vintage and intended way ones that could just even go even for 10 years. Um, so they have to, before they gorge, they have to like riddle all the yeast into the end of the, um, the neck of the bottle such that then they go and do a liquid nitrogen dip and it instantly freezes it and then pops it out and then they put a new cork in. So it, it requires a lot of effort and some of it is automated. Some of the fancier ones that cost you more money would have this all done by hand. Um, so you know kind of that's why champagne costs what it costs. But there are other alternatives. And the other ones would be um, like forced carbonation, which is how we get beer. You would have your wine that's fermented at the end. You like it. You just put it in a tank and you force that CO2 there to create the bubbles. And a good way to try that is to compare a non-vintage champagne and a Prosecco. Prosecco was, you know, obviously it's also, what, $12, $15? So it's probably a third of the cost. And it's because of the way they create those bubbles. Um, and if you try it, you would probably see that the Prosecco's bubbles are a bit harsher. They would just have a different mouthfeel. Uh, and that's what you're paying when you get champagne. Then, um, gee, there was one more method that I forget. Um, uh, the Charmat method. There's another method. I'm, I'm forgetting the other one, which is how they do um, uh, the, like, Moscato di Asti. So even then, they use a different process to get the bubbles in there. And and some of the more even um, cheaper uh, wines would use, you know, processes to kind of get that CO2 into the wine. But so which ones to avoid? I don't know. Um, if you want to be safe, I would stay with champagne and try to get the cheapest champagne that you get. You, you They have certain laws and requirements of, of, of what they need to have in, in those wines. So I think it's a safer bet. However, it's you're paying more money. But if you really want to try new things, Prosecco would be next on things to try. But really where the value is and where I should, you know, you should, I would really push people to go to is Cava. Cava has, uh, is done in the champagne method, but it's done in Spain. And it's at the same almost price range of Prosecco. It's a bit more expensive than Prosecco, like $20 um, in total cost. But if you get something that's Reserva, a reserve one, it's just a as good as the vintage one that costs $90. And it'll probably cost you like $35. So for me, that's really the, the holy grail of value, which is the sparkling wine from, from Spain. Uh, things to avoid would be, I don't know. It, there's some... Anything that's cheap, below $10, and it's from Australia or from all of these places where... Now, this leads us to another conversation of why is the Australia wine in the cheaper end? And that's because they just automate everything. They have the land uh, that's not too hilly, so they just have machines pick everything, crush everything, and produce the wine. Um, and so their labor cost is, are, is less, but hence a lot of the nuances that we like in wine are kind of not there. And so that's why. So that's kind of my feedback. I, I Rather than say, stay away from this, I would say, like, go to that, which is just drink kava for, like, an affordable, good experience for uh, sparkling wine. Okay. Well, that's a that's a good tip. I, I have not had kava too much, um, but I will go look for it. All right. So I want to close this out with a small series of questions, you know, sort of a tip of the hat to James Lipton and a friend of mine, Nikki P., and this is, if you're familiar with the actor studio, James just asks some, uh, he asks acting kind of questions, but I'm going to change it up a little bit. Uh, so the first one is, of the five flavors, sweet, salty, bitter, sour, umami, which one do you enjoy the most? In, in general, in food or in wine? You pick. Just in general. I think... Yeah, for me, I enjoy umami more. I think there, you know, if you, you, I can just take you to that spaghetti di dinner or a good lasagna, you know, or how tomato has this umami taste or a really, really good ramen, you know, this um, kind of meaty, earthy, I don't know, it's even hard to describe, right? The, the, 
truffle taste, all of these, it just seems something that's um, so complex and rich and it just makes your mouth water. I don't know. It, it, that's my favorite one. Oh, I think you nailed that. That's about, <laughs> that's about as good a description as you're going to get. Uh, what's your favorite food? Uh, food, you know, uh, like uh, country-wise or style-wise, you mean? Doesn't matter. What's your favorite food? So I have I have my death row meal. That's that's how I kind of ranked uh, favorite food. And uh, you know my uh, ethnicity. I'm I'm originally from Mexico, um, and but I've kind of learned to love Indian food. So for me, my last meal would be uh, a chicken tikka masala. I know it's not authentic uh, Indian. It's a product of you know British and all of this, but. Just bear with me. Chicken tikka masala from this place called Clay Pit in um, Mill Creek in Washington State. Um, they had also this uh, cheese naan, three cheese naan. Again, not authentic, but hey, it's cheese and it's in bread and it's delicious. Um, there's this beer that I really enjoy and it's not, sorry, it's not wine, but uh, it's called Mac and Jack's uh, African Amber. I like malt in beer versus hops. I still love good IPAs and everything, but hey, this is the last meal I'm going to get. Mac and Jack's African Amber. Uh, and then for dessert, uh, a good like molten lava cake with a glass of milk. Uh-huh. That would be that would be it. And you can you know put me to pasture after that. All right. Well, we won't do that. But what's your least favorite food? I don't. My least favorite thing to enjoy. Of course, this is saying like, hey, if there's nothing else to eat, I'll obviously eat it. But I don't tend to like soups. And when I well, actually not soups, broths that much. So fa not my thing. You know, it's just, I don't find it as satisfying as I would want. I know I like kind of the the umami flavor of it, but it just feels, I don't know. I I don't like a lot of the the mint and uh, kind of the the vegetables that they use. It's just not, it's just not my thing. What gets you excited? Traveling to a new place in wine region and trying the wine and food there. What turns you off? (sighs) Traffic. (laughs) What sound do you love? I guess my children's laugh. Ah, uh, yes. Well, every parent says that, but it's understandable. I would say the same thing. What sound noise do you hate? Crying. Oh, yeah. And lastly, Joel, what is your favorite food indulgence? Favorite food indulgence? Hmm. Gee, that's... Uh, I think it changes a lot. Um. Hmm. Right now, let's just talk right now. There is this Bib Gourmand place, a Mexican place here in San Jose, uh, called uh, Luna Mexican Kitchen. They have these really good, like they're called parrilladas. They're just it's just like carne asada that you put in and you make some tacos. And they have like this melted cheese thing you put in with some avocado. Yeah, that that would be it. So tacos, I guess, is my answer. That's okay. It's in, they'll they'll be thrilled that you that you love them so much. Well, Joel, I thank you so much for your time today. This was an eye-opening and a wine bottle opening uh, excursion. And I hope our listeners do go and take advantage of, you know, you got to study hard, so open some wine bottles. (laughs) Yep. That's the only way to get better is to not be biased or try really, really hard to not be biased and explore, right? I guess every wine unopened is just a missed opportunity to find something that really is wonderful. Well, that is a perfect way to end the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And we'll talk again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much again. And, you know, hopefully we do this more often. All right, folks, that's going to do it. As you shop and consider your wines for tasting, maybe a spaghetti dinner isn't the best pairing option. But cheese is. Visit my affiliate De Bruno Brothers for an amazing selection of cheeses as well as cured meats for a perfect wine tasting evening. De Bruno Brothers is actually the whole family, uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, and sisters, and they've been culinary pioneers in Philadelphia, the city that knows food, for 80 years. Head over to the show notes page, culinarylibertarian.com slash 24. For the link to De Bruno Brothers and start your wine and cheese pairing experience. Culinarylibertarian.com slash 24. (music) 
All right. Well, thank you very much for helping me with this. I appreciate that. Sure. I think my, uh, you know, the base disclaimer, uh, you know, I, I have the certification from the Court of Master Sommelier. Um, I guess I'm not necessarily a winemaker. I saw some of the questions you had and they, you know, they go really kind of deep into technical of winemaking. So, I've, you know, I've been in a cellar where the winemaker can walk you through the processes that they make, but really making wine is kind of this art that, you know, there's a lot of science to it, but if it was, if it was as scientific as, as, as we knew, then every wine would be great, but it's not. So there's definitely a lot of things that mother nature can do. And a lot of things that a winemaker can do to make something either really, either really, really good or really, really bad. So we can talk about in a glance what those things might be, but you know, I don't know how deep I can dive into those. Well, that's okay. So you you are currently level two, or you're working on level two? No, I'm currently at level two. Well, <laughs> that's that is quite a feat because very few people can get to level two, and never mind level three. Forget about that. So. That um, what you know about wine transcends nearly everybody. So you are in an elite class to start with. Um, so yes, some of those things. So you know when I there's both the science, but really there's the craft. And to me, you they both depend on each other, but. Really, you're just taking juice and fermenting it, and that's the science part. The craft is, which one of these 40 different yeasts do you pick? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. There's, so, yeah, this, it, it, we'll do what we can, but really the, the intent is to be, since, since, since there's almost no limit to how far anyone can go in studying and learning wines because you, you've got... At minimum, two, red or white. But then you, you've got varietals and you've got all of these other rabbit holes to go down where if one chose, you could exclude one color and focus entirely on these things and become an expert or the other way around. So... That's really up to the person. I have no way of knowing who wants what, but I think there are some basics we can for for the people who say, you know, I'm I don't I don't hate wine, but I don't even know where to start. And I think that that's one of the big problems is it's so overwhelming. And when you go to your grocery store, you you ask the anybody, and they all look at you like you've got lobsters crawling out your ears. Uh, wine, uh, it's over there. Thanks. So let's let's find some way to at least facilitate a learning. Now they have to do the work, but you know we'll do what we can. Right. I, I have actually a, a kind of a method that I recommend people, and and I think what we could do if you want. Um, I always like to walk people that are brand new on wine because walking down the wine aisle is a very daunting thing, right? You see all these colorful labels. There's things that are in the bottom racks. There are things that are in the top ranks. There are things that are fairly cheap, and there are things that are fairly expensive. How do you know, you know, what's going on? And um, if you want, we can kind of start there and kind of go like, what does it mean to be in the bottom of the aisle, and and how do you progress to go to the top? What does it mean a certain price point versus other price points? And I think the ultimate recommendation that I have for these people is you need to drink wine. Um, but there are there are kind of guidelines that may send you towards the right one, but a lot of it is really you have to try wine, and there's a trial and error aspect of it, and that's kind of the fun of it, you know, finding really great wine, and then you know occasionally maybe finding things that are not for you, and that's okay. Well, that's how we learn. So before we, get to, I would love that. That's perfect. 